What's going on everybody and welcome back to another video. We're trying something a little bit different today. I'm going to be answering the questions that I get most frequently in terms of either comments or direct messages to me. Just very common questions. I want to make a couple things clear. First of all, there are no stupid questions. Uh, this is not me replying to stupid questions. This is not me replying to amateur basic questions. This is just me replying to literally the most common things that pop up all the time in a way for me to just try and help you guys understand, especially if you're new brewers, how some of these things work um, and hopefully help you guys answer those questions even before you have to ask them. I think depending on who you ask the same questions to, you may get different answers from different people, but this is just my response to the top 10, I think, uh, common questions that I always seem to get on a lot of different things. For the record, I'm not annoyed that people are asking me these questions so much. I want to make that clear. Please feel free to ask these questions as you need to. I'm just hoping that this video helps you answer them before you even have to ask them in the first place. So without further ado, let's jump into it. So the first question I seem to get on almost every video is, can I ferment this beer under pressure? Um, and the way I want you to frame this question is instead of can I, yes, you could do anything you want. Um, it's home brewing, it's up to you. The question you should be asking is, should I ferment this under pressure or do I need to ferment this under pressure? The reason why most people get into pressure fermentation besides the fact that it's trendy is because they have a warm environment and they need to ferment beer that's typically fermented at a cooler temperature than their warmer environment will allow them to without temperature control. That's easily the most common uh, reason for doing pressure fermentation and it's a great reason and it's a great technique to use to get around that problem. You could really do any beer under pressure that you want to, it's just whether or not should you is or do you need to is really the question you need to be asking. So to answer that question, I'd say think about what is the kind of beer you're trying to make? Are there flavors that are derived from yeast, specifically esters, things that you might want in your beer as opposed to a cleaner beer character? And the question is, am I dry hopping? Uh, if you're dry hopping under pressure, there's a very, very specific way to do that to avoid having a beer explosion due to the uh, nucleation points and dry hops upsetting the CO2 in solution. I would Recommend if you're dry hopping a beer, don't do it under pressure if you can, or add that pressure after you add your dry hop. If you're doing something that's really heavily yeast flavored, I would recommend not pressure fermenting it if you can avoid it. Oftentimes though, those beers that are high in that yeast character like to ferment at higher temperatures. For example, Belgian ales have a ton of flavor that comes from yeast, and you don't wanna really suppress that by adding additional pressure, but you also are happily able to ferment these beers up in the 70s, in the 80s Fahrenheit. Uh, in some cases, they'll go higher than that, and it's totally fine. Uh, so I wouldn't recommend adding pressure if you don't need to. The second most common question is, uh, hey, my beer's gravity is uh, saying that it's 1028, 1025. It's um, you know somewhere way higher than my recipe said it was gonna finish at like 1010 or 1011. Uh, and I'm worried that it's not gonna reach the final gravity in time. Um, and it's been like this for two weeks or so. And then I ask a question to follow up on that. I'm like, well, are you using a tilt or a floating hydrometer or something like that? And like, oh yeah, that's my only source of gravity readings. You need to confirm your final gravity with something other than a floating hydrometer. Floating hydrometers are almost always thrown off by high Krausen or by hops, uh, debris sticking to them or yeast sticking to them. It causes the angle to change due to just stuff sticking to it. Um, some are better than others at combating this problem, but for the most part, this will throw your final gravity readings off. I highly recommend if you're using a floating hydrometer, do not rely on it as a specifically 100% accurate instrument for reading your final gravity. It's a great tool to determine how your fermentation is progressing. It's a really great way to know your fermentation is actually done when you see that final number stay flat. However, that final number is probably not accurate. So you need to be confirming that number with a hydrometer or with a digital refractometer or something that can make the uh, adjustment for the alcohol in the beer. Just use a second instrument to confirm your final gravity is where you said it was instead of saying that, hey, I have a stalled fermentation, which may not actually be the case. Your beer may be much, much lower. I've gotten that question at least 10 times and it's always been the same situation. So just try to have two sources of information for your final gravity for uh, saying that your beer is stalled. The next most common question that I get from people is, um, hey, my beer is tasting like, insert random off flavor. Why is that? 
nine times out of 10, when you get a random off flavor in the beer, things that taste like green apple, things that taste like butter, things that taste harsh or strong or alcoholic, too bitter, uh, too sweet, things like that, that problem is nine times out of 10 related to your either your pitch or your actual fermentation. Uh, so most of the time, that homebrew character that's hard to kind of describe and identify, or that uh, the most common off flavors in general that people are concerned about and they message me about are uh, things like acetaldehyde, things like diacetyl, things like um, fusel alcohols and other kind of excessive characteristics from a stressed fermentation. So you wanna make sure that you're always pitching enough yeast, do a calculation, figure out how much yeast you need to pitch and then pitch a little bit more than that. Uh, it's always better to pitch more yeast than to pitch less yeast. Pitch it at a cold temperature. Usually what I like to do, if I have a target fermentation temperature, I'll drop the temperature of the wort down two or three degrees below that temperature before I pitch my yeast. It's the best way to guarantee you don't have off flavors that result from pitching your yeast too warm. Seriously, that's like the number one issue. Next, make sure you're fermenting your beer at the proper temperature and not deviating from it as much as you can, like within reason. Plus or minus two or three degrees as it fluctuates, that's okay. Um, if you have a kind of like a, a day night cycle fluctuation, that's all right. But plus or minus five to 10 degrees, that's not going to really uh, make good things happen for your beer. So just try to stay away from having that temperature fluctuation as much as possible. Try to make sure you're fermenting your beer a little bit cooler than you think you need to. Try to make sure you're pitching a little bit more yeast than you think you need to and pitch it a little colder than you think you need to. That will actually solve 99% of your problems in terms of off flavors. If you know for a fact that you're taking care of your fermentation, look to your recipe. If you have a little too much harsh astringent bitterness there, it could be a water problem. It could be a, uh, a malt selection problem. Oftentimes folks throw a little too much caramel malt in there or high roasted caramel malts and they get bitterness out of that. And they were wondering why does my beer taste like burnt sugar and really harsh astringent bitterness? It might be because you threw too much caramel 120 in the beer or you added too much black malt or something like that. But if you're trying to troubleshoot a specific off flavor, I recommend start with your fermentation and kind of evaluate how things work and then work back from there because you're kind of eliminating the most common and stuff first and then you kind of work back towards your actual recipe construction or your water source or something like that. If you're curious more about off flavors, I have a really thorough video on off flavors that I recommend checking out. So I'm gonna pop that up in the corner. Please do look at that if you're having trouble diagnosing whatever issue you're dealing with uh, in terms of off flavors. The next question I get a lot of is, can I use Lutra to make this? Lutra is a wildly popular yeast for a reason. It's a solidly clean fermenting beer yeast that will be done in a matter of days versus a matter of weeks. And it tends to make some really clean beer, really easy to make pseudo lagers with. It's a great yeast. I have absolutely nothing against using Lutra. But I do recommend if you're using Lutra for a particular beer, please take care of the pH. Uh, Lutra will drop the final pH of the beer from about 4.2 down to about 4.0. I did a side-by-side -side Oktoberfest beer that evaluated this particular condition and it makes a tangible impact in the final product. You can get around this by tweaking the pH of the beer a little bit prior to pitching your Lutra, um, and you should be able to get it to finish at the right level uh, to really emulate a lager. That's one way, but really that's the big thing that I try to warn people about. Also, a lot of people use Lutra at regular ale temperatures because um, they like the way it tastes. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, I would just recommend if you're using Lutra, try to evaluate what kind of yeast you really do need for the task and take care of your pH as well because it can bite you in the end. And kind of like in a bonus question here, one of the most common variations I get on this particular question is on my lager videos, people are like, oh, I wanna use Lutra for this. Can I use Lutra under pressure for this? Lutra is a great solution for making a lager-like beer, um, but under pressure, it's not necessarily required to ferment Lutra under pressure. If you're already at a high temperature, Lutra will handle that just fine. If you're fermenting under pressure already, and you're using a non-lager yeast to get a lager-like effect, at a higher temperature, I would actually recommend that people use a lager yeast under pressure because you'll still be able to get that lager character with the lager yeast, of course, and you won't have the annoying pH drop that Kvik always has. And you'll be able to do it under pressure at a higher temperature that you'd otherwise be using Lutra for. The next question I get a lot is, um, or comment rather, I suppose this is a comment, is, hey, I have the exact same equipment as you and I brewed your exact same recipe and it's different. What the hell? 
there's a lot of variables in brewing and just because you have the exact same equipment and you put the exact same amounts of ingredients in at the same times doesn't mean you're gonna get the exact same beer. If you have the exact same fermentation conditions, the exact same dissolved oxygen in the wort, the exact same mash temperature fluctuations, the exact same dough-in rate, the exact same water chemistry, the exact same mash pH, the exact same boil pH, the exact same alpha acids on the hops, a lot of people forget about that one, uh, the exact same maltsters making your malt, yeah, there's a lot of variables in there that are not encapsulated within recipe formulation themselves. My recipes should always just be a guide. You should look at that as a plus or minus, depending on what you're planning to get out of them. Um, but don't look at them as an exact plug and play, make this exact beer, and it's going to look and taste and feel the exact same way as you saw on YouTube. That's honestly never really the case. You're gonna have fluctuation there. Please understand that, um, please, Look at them as a guide, as a method uh, for making a particular type of beer, but please don't look at them as the end all be all for how to make this beer style. That's not at all what I'm trying to do here. So um, if you're trying to make my recipes and you're having issues with them, uh, even if you have the same equipment, feel free to let me know. I will try to help troubleshoot that. But um, at the end of the day, do understand there's gonna be some variation there. The next question I get a lot of is, why are you using spring water instead of distilled water? Basically, when you're building a water profile off of a base type of water, you want to have water that is at least consistent in its water chemistry, but at the end of the day, if you have something that you just have a blank canvas for and has zero parts per million, zero to five parts per million of, of all brewing minerals, then you're pretty much good to go to build whatever water profile you want off of that. Um, I use distilled water for many, many years, and it's a great canvas to build a water profile on. However, it's also rather expensive. Usually when I buy eight gallons of strike water, uh, which is my typical volume, I'm running about three to four dollars per gallon of distilled water, and it's also kind of harder to find. It's not as common as uh, spring water is here, in the United States at least. So I stopped using distilled water for that reason. I moved to spring water as my base, and specifically Poland Spring, because it is very consistent with the water profile that is put out. There is a publicly available water profile on Poland Spring, and if you look that water profile up on their website, you'll see that there is about five to ten parts per million max maximum of all of the typical brewing minerals that you're gonna need. Uh, there's no added bicarbonates in there, and the pH is where it's supposed to be for good neutral brewing water base. It's actually just as easy to build a profile off of that neutral spring water as it is to build off of distilled water. But the reason why I add my water profiles as, you know, adding to zero parts per million of everything is so that everyone else can build their own water profiles on top of their own RO spring or distilled water. The only thing you really do need to be uh, paying attention to is is that spring water actually the same as my spring water if you're using spring water? Uh, you don't have to use spring water. Um, again, goes back to that what other variables do I have in my recipe and why is my beer not coming out the same way? You don't have to use spring water and also considering in Europe Spring water means like mineral water. So you're looking at like hundreds of parts per million of minerals in there. It's the opposite thing. So uh, with that in mind, that notion of spring water not meaning the same thing around the globe, um, I am gonna be moving to an RO system so that I can solve the cost problem because that will pay for itself really fast and also to solve the uh, actual discrepancy issues across the globe. So that should help a lot. Uh, at the end of the day, I'm hoping that people appreciate that move and that that helps answer that question. The next question I get commonly is, my beer has been fermenting for like three to five days and uh, yeah, it tastes kind of funny. It doesn't taste right. You gotta let your fermentation finish before you try to evaluate how your beer is doing. Let your beer go for a full week before you taste it and try to evaluate what's going on if something's wrong. Every single fermentation produces acetaldehyde. Every single fermentation produces diacetyl, no matter how you're fermenting. These products are produced during the first primary phase of fermentation, the first three to five days. That is happening while the yeast is consuming sugar. After that, the yeast is finished consuming sugar, you might be hitting your final gravity. At that point, the yeast is starting to reabsorb and metabolize the diacetyl, the acetaldehyde, the other off flavor producing chemicals in there that you will be tasting at three to five days. It'll also be metabolizing some of the sharp alcohol character. There's a period of time that happens after your final gravity is reached where the yeast will actually make your beer taste better. So we need to understand if we're asking that question, 
uh, that the fermentation is a two-stage process and you have to let it complete both stages of that process before you analyze whether or not your beer has an off flavor in it. So I hope that makes sense and I hope that helps answer that question. Another question I get a lot of is, uh, is my beer infected? Or is, is this particular action going to cause my beer to be infected? Uh, there's a lot of folks out there who are very hesitant to brew with variations on wild yeast and, and bacterial strains because they are concerned, rightfully so, about having a persistence in their brew house and an infection uh, happening in their beer down the line. Uh, so there's a couple things I want to say about that. Good on you for being concerned about sanitation because sanitation is still the number one thing to be concerned about in brewing. However, it is actually much harder to have an infection occur in your brew house than one might think because I've tried and I've also made mistakes before where I haven't sanitized stuff and stuck it in the beer or I've like straight up touched, you know, the wort by accident pulling out like a hot bag with my bare hands or other things like that. Um, and, you know, honestly, there's there's periods of time where I don't take all of my brewing equipment apart between batches and clean every single uh, crack and crevice. You know, sometimes I just let the PBW go through there and let the star sand go through there and kind of hope for the best. I'm honest about this because nine times out of ten, people are doing the same thing. Uh, you don't have to be completely anal about sanitation, but it does help. It certainly makes you more consistent and it reduces the risk of a future infection. However, um, I've only ever been bit by a persistent infection of a microorganism one time, and it wasn't bacteria or botanomyces. It was Lutra Kvike. A standard brewer's yeast was the thing that got me in the end and caused me to dump a batch. If you're brewing with hops, like most people do, um, the alpha acids in hops actually fight bacterial infections so effectively that lactobacillus cannot reproduce in a beer that has over 15 IBUs of bitterness in it. That should help kind of frame how hard it is to get an infection. Britannomyces is far harder to get uh, rid of because it just gets into everything, uh, but if you're good about segregating your equipment or you just boil something, uh, that will tend to actually kill off everything inside of it. The one thing that's tough to fight, infection-wise, is actually mold. Um, and if you brew in a deep, dark, dank brew cave basement like I do, then you are going to be dealing with mold a lot. Relatively frequently during the summer, there's a decent amount of mold that grows on things that are not being used in my brew house. As long as you're cleaning those things off before you add them to your fermenter and sanitizing them, mold's a very slow-growing organism. Uh, it, and as long as you, you know, keep an eye on it, it should be fine. Beer actually kind of evolved to be rather good at fighting off uh, spoiling organisms. It has a low pH, which is actually one of the best things to help prevent any sort of infection. Um, it has hops in it, so the alpha acids kill off uh, various kinds of bacteria. Alcohol inhibits other things from growing in the beer too. So it, there's a lot of things going for it. It's very unlikely that you are going to infect your batch of beer uh, if you do anything short of just leaving your fermenter out in the open uncleaned and then letting it crust over and then putting a different kind of beer in it, like, then you're kind of asking for it. But you have to work pretty hard to infect your beer. The next most common question I get is, how do I add fruit flavor to a beer without losing the fruitiness? Um, so that's a good question because Oftentimes, you just dump fruit into a beer, you're gonna actually have the fermentation uh, take place again. Those sh sugary, sweet, delicious fruit flavors are going to turn into tart and sour flavors, which may not be palatable for many people and may not be what you intended. There's actually many ways to answer this question, um, and it all depends on what you wanna do with your particular brew. If you're adding any sort of flavor to a beer, I guarantee you there's an extract out there that tastes like it. That's not the preferred answer. That's not my preferred method either. Extracts tend to taste kind of fake and harsh, um, and it's very easy to overdo them in a beer. So I recommend if you can avoid it, don't use an extract. Um, but it is one way to do it without losing too much flavor. Secondly, if you have uh, actual real fruit you're adding or a puree that you're adding, Pay attention to your actual expected final gravity. Um, if you are brewing a beer that has a standard final gravity, 10-10, 10-12, or lower, uh, you're gonna expect that beer to actually attenuate further when you're adding simple sugars that are in fruit. Uh, so you're gonna get a drier finish. 
The higher final gravity you have, we're talking 1015, 1020, something like that, the more sweetness will be left in the beer, which will back up that fruit flavor, even if it ferments out some of the simple sugars in the fruit itself. That is a great way to balance the beer to give you that kind of fruity sensation. Another method here is to use something like lactose, an unfermentable sugar, to give you that backbone after fermentation without worrying about restarting the fermentation. That's a great way to do it as well. Just be careful because lactose can get uh, pretty sweet pretty quickly quick. And last but certainly not least, you can also stabilize your beer by adding in uh, your typical stabilization chemicals, the sorbate, the metabisulfite. That will actually stop the yeast from fermenting and it'll keep that fruit character in the beer uh, without having the simple sugars be fermented. So that's another great way to do it as well. Next most common question I get asked is, what system do I need? I'm like, holy crap, that's a huge question and I don't think I'm gonna be able to answer that one easily because there's a million systems out there now. The market's saturated for all-in-one electric brewing systems. What I recommend the most, honestly, is not the system that I have right now, um, because the system I have right now is meant for more intermediate or more invested brewers. If you're getting into home brewing and you're looking to buy a system, I really hope you don't expose yourself too much financially to the hobby because you may not like it. And if you don't like it, you should not be out thousands of dollars just because you wanted to try something and these systems can get stupidly expensive. So what I really recommend to try it out is look into either the Anvil Foundry or the uh, Kegland Brusilla options. These are cheaper for what you're paying. They offer a ton of features um, and they honestly are probably the easiest way to get started with uh, electric all grain brewing. But if you don't want to go that route, I also would recommend looking into just plain old brew in a bag, order a brewing kit from an online manufacturer, get a mesh bag that can handle some heat, get a good sized five to eight gallon stock pot and use a brew in the bag method to do your all grain mash or go the extract route without the bag. Um, all of these things are easy ways to get into the hobby that don't expose you too much financially and I think are a great way to determine whether or not you're going to like it. Don't be buying systems that cost thousands of dollars right off the bat. Don't be buying really expensive pieces of equipment. You don't need it to get started. Feel free to drop down that rabbit hole later uh, if you want to and you get really into this hobby and you want to start fine tuning things and, you know, getting all this shiny equipment in, in wherever you brew. Like that's that's fine if that's what you want to do. So uh, just don't do it right off the bat, please. So that's my recommendation for starter uh, systems or starter pieces of equipment, which uh, hopefully will help you guys out a little bit as well. So I hope I helped you guys answer some of those questions preemptively. Once again, there's no stupid questions. These are not stupid questions. These are just common questions. And I have no problem answering them. I have no problems with people who ask them. At the end of the day, I just hope this helped you out in the long run. If you enjoyed the video and you learned something, please go ahead, hit the like button, most importantly, and subscribe as well if you haven't already. Comment down below if you have any more questions, please ask them. I would be happy to answer them for you. If you want to support the channel, please consider picking up a t-shirt like this one. You can find this and many other designs in my Teespring store, which is in the description box. Please also check out my Patreon. I release videos early there and there's a couple other benefits that you uh, might be interested in. My Patreon supporters are really huge in helping out this channel and supporting it, so you have my utmost thanks. Please also check out the super thanks button and the channel memberships options as well if you uh, want to go that route. Please also check out my Amazon store where I have all of my recommended brewing equipment that's available on Amazon, as well as also the uh, recording equipment that I use to make the channel happen if you're curious about that stuff. I'm also available on Instagram and Facebook as The Apartment Brewer, so check those links out as well for some more frequent content updates. And last but certainly not least, if you're still here and uh, you're still with us, I really appreciate you watching all the way to the end of the video. It means a lot to me. I put a lot of work into these videos and I hope you're getting a lot out of them by Clearly you are if you're still watching to the end. So anyway, I appreciate you being here. It's in the morning, I'm not drinking, but normally this would be a beer. Anyway guys, I hope you uh, enjoyed the video and this one goes out to you. So till the next one, cheers. Cheers.